So, we have been discussing about different advanced surface characterization techniques for the last 4 or 5 even more 7 lectures. So, the last technique which I am going to discuss in detail is known as secondary ion mass spectroscopy. In the literature it is always written as SIMS being the acronym for secondary ion mass spectroscopy. This is very advanced technique and very few laboratories in India have access to this technique. As far as I know only the laboratories access to the atomic energy like uh, BRC or IGCAR they have access to these facilities. But still for the understanding of different students we need to discuss this technique in detail. The literature is very well known in these topics. The most important book on which literatures are available I have listed at the bottom. First one is by J. C. Vickerman, second one is again the Encyclopedia of Material Characterizations edited by Bundle and Evans and Wilson. These two books are easily available in different libraries, so you can have access. The outline of this presentation is as follows. First, I am going to discuss about historical background of SIMS, but before I discuss about historical background of SIMS, I must talk about the mass spectroscopy per se. Then I am going to talk about the difference between MS and the SIMS and most notably the what are these two techniques are, so that you can get a feeling of mass spectroscopy and secondary ion mass spectroscopy. Obviously, these two techniques are related followed by I will discuss the working principle of both the techniques and then I am going to talk about different measurements which can be done by SIMS. Also lastly the advantage disadvantage and some amount of instrumentations. As you know it all started in about 110 years back by Sir J. J. Thompson who first basically built the prototype of mass spectroscopy to measure the m by z of any electron mass by species charge. And as you know he was awarded an old prize in 1906 for his discovery and for many other things which he has made. But basically the first concept of mass spectroscopy came into practice by a gentleman known Francis Aston who was working in Cambridge in England and he actually first principle or concept of mass spectroscopy was put forward into practice by him and he was also awarded Nobel Prize in the year 1922. Then it saw a huge effort to make the mass spectroscopy popular, different kinds of mass spectroscopic techniques came into picture. But the real problem in dealing with mass spectroscopy was the vacuum systems. In early 20th century basically 1910 to 1930, 1935 the vacuum technology was not so well known. So, the technique was not has not progressed much. Only in 1948 to 40, 52 in the post second world war era the important time of flight mass analyzer came into picture and changed the scenario. It was followed by a major discovery again by Paul W. Paul which led to quadruple ion filters and this quadruple ion filters actually has allowed us to measure this, this uh, you know pieces of different mass by z value m by z values and because of this very famous discovery in 1955. W. Paul was awarded an old prize in 1989. Actually, he also invents ion trap in 1983 for information. In after that, in 1968, it saws the, the development of tandem mass spectrometers. And secondary ion spectroscopy came little later, 
at about 1980s when the secondary ions production was possible by different primary ion sources. To give you a better idea of SIMS, the most important problem in developing SIMS was the pumping technology, vacuum technology as I told already and that is actually uh, hindered the growth of these SIMS. In fact, only in 1940s actually 1948 or so the first ex prototype experiments in SIMS was done at University of Vienna, Austria. Austria. In 1960s two SIMS experiment was developed but not so good. One was an American project for analyzing moon rocks, other was for the University of Paris. These first experiments were based on a magnetic double focusing selector field mass spectroscopy and used argon as a primary ion beam. Obviously, these things are not known to you, I am going to discuss in detail. And then this was followed by recent development on focusing this noble primary ion sources, physicists like C60, even ionized clusters of gold and bismuth. And this followed lot of instrumentation and the computation of the technique and now it is fully automated and comes at a cost of about few tens of crores of rupees. Well, what is actually mass spectroscopy? That is you must know first. So, mass spectrometry or mass spectroscopy is basically an analytical technique as any spectroscopic technique, but it measures a different thing. It measures mass to charge ratio of any charged particle. You must remember this, any mass spectroscopy does not measure mass, it measures mass to the charge ratio of any charge pieces. So, therefore, in any sample whatever you material you think of there is no charge pieces because samples will be neutral. You need to create the charge pieces first and then by using certain technique you can measure this mass to charge ratio. This is a characteristics of any charge whether it is a single ion, single atom ion charge or it is a multiple ion charge or uh, multiple pieces charge does not matter, but this is a very characteristic things. It have used in both quantitative and qualitative analysis to determine the composition of the structure of specific compounds. Not only that it allows us to be used as analytical method to measure the molecular and atomic weights of the sample. So, it has a versatility as you can see, it gives a host of informations and I have listed only few of them in this slide. First and foremost, it allows us to determine the chemical and structural information of any molecule. Any molecule or any ionic pieces you see, it, it, it gives us an understanding of chemical and structural nature of that molecule. Then it allows us to identify the unknown compounds start with. It also allows us to quantify the known compounds. We can actually determine the relative abundance of isotopes and measure the exact masses. Remember, it is possible to measure the exact mass of the isotope. Those masses you see in the books reported are basically measured using SIMS. And then it also allows us to measure the molecular mass of any sample correct. Now, if you look at the uses it is used in wide spectrum irrespective of different branches of science and engineering. Most important one it is used in geological problems basically in oil consumptions or oil production units like you know in oil production unit there are different kinds of chemical pieces available organic and it allows us to detect them. Then comes the pharmaceutical industry that is pharmacokinetics, drug discovery, drug mechanism. Next one which uses this technique extensively is space application like composition of the plasmas and the solar winds by the astrophysicist. Obviously, it can be used for environmental technique like water quality, food contamination, biotechnology. In fact, it can be used in high vacuum system, smart spectrometers to be used to measure even the residual gases present in a particular systems. If you look at this series, I have not mentioned about materials science. So, obviously, material science is involved in all these things. We can use this particular spectroscopic vacuum technique for analyzing our day to day materials or the materials which you are actually preparing in the labs in detailed manner. Well, so 
basically after knowing this mass spectroscopy and the advantage and that these things, what actually a mass spectrometer needs to have? What are the basic things it must have? Well, basically it must obviously have a sample because that is what we are analyzing and then we have to have a you know source of ions. So, sample is ionized and we create different sources of ions. This is what is done by these techniques which I am going to discuss. And then these ions are actually analyzed based on you know mass to charge ratio by using either quadruples or time of flight measurements and this then they are detected either a photographic plate or electron multiplier or Faraday cup a different kinds of detectors available. And the whole system whole thing is kept this whole thing is has to be evacuated because the ions needs to move forward from the source to the detector. So, their movement should not be hindered by any kind of residual molecule gaseous molecule present in the system. So, vacuum systems to be of the order of you know create a vacuum of the order of minus 9 to minus 10 tor inside the chamber and this all actually leads to the cost of the instrument. So, this is the basically three models of any mass spectroscopy. And since both the analyzer and detector remain same only thing which gets changed is the source. We do create secondary ions using the primary ions ok, but in a mass spectroscopy we use primary ions to analyze these masses. So, in a nutshell if I have to show you in a very chart what you need is to create ions and this can be done by ionizations you can do by electro spray you can do multi I will tell you you can do even uh, you know other ionization techniques like you can use a primary source of ion as sputter and create ions. And then after you created the ions you have to collect the ions you collect the ions and then you separate them in a different mass to charge ratio that is what is done by mass analyzer it can be multi time of flight or it can be quadruple time of flight it can be quadruple time of uh, flight only or you can be triple quadruple also and uh, there are many others actually but these are the main ones. After that we have to detect the masses and that is done by mass spectrum analysis also you need to have a database like x ray diffraction has a database and many others. So, this is the main thing of a mass spectroscopy only thing as I said is going to change in SIMS is basically this part these two parts other two parts will remain same. So, uh, actually you create ion source you can have a gas ion mass analyze and detector this is what I have told. So, in a not in a basically pictorial things I can say there is an ionizer and there is a mass analyzer there is a detector that is how the ions actually move through this. How do you analyze ionize actually that is what we must know there are different ways of ionizing first one is known as fast atom bombardment or fab. If this is nothing but impact of five velocity atoms on a sample dissolves in liquid matrix. If you have a high velocity atoms like argon or oxygen or cesium and these atoms actually are allowed to fall on a sample which is kept inside liquid matrix it can create ions of the atoms in the sample. Second one is secondary ion mass spectroscopics and this is the topics of today discussion. It is nothing but impact of high velocity ions on a thin flame of a sample of a metal sub on a metal substrate. It can be also dissolved in liquid matrix. So, by this way these fast ion drum bombardment and secondary ion mass specs actually the preparation of ions are almost similar what you need to have is impact of the high velocity ions uh, in case of SIMS and in case of fast fab you need to have impact of high velocity atoms. Then you can always have a plasma desorption. This is a nothing but impact of nuclear fission fragments. Nuclear fission fragments are always, uh, you know, like alpha particle, gamma particle, or beta particles. These fission fragments can lead to plasma desorption. You can also have a technique known as so we have discussed this, this, this. We can also have a technique known as matrix assisted laser desorption and ionization, which is known as MALDI that is what I have been I, I talked in the last slide. So, it does actually 
create ions by impact of high energy photons on a sample embedded in a solid organic matrix. So, you create a photon, photon is nothing but you know H nu uh, with laser has lot of photon or quanta and this is basically uh, allowed to fall at a high velocity on a sample which is embedded in a solid organic matrix and that is how you can ionize ions. Then one can do field resorption on electrospray. Field resorption is nothing but imposition of high electrical field gradient on a sample deposition on a special solid substrate. Those of you who have some idea about atom probe, in an atom probe we do the same thing actually, we just create a large, we impose a high electrical field between the sample and another electrode and because of the creation of the high electric field, the ions on the sample is just dislodged or the atoms in the sample are dislodged and created comes as an ion. Electro spray is basically very simple, much simpler than all these techniques. It is nothing but a formation of charged liquid droplets from which ions are desolvated or dissolved. You have a charged liquid droplet, you can create charged liquid droplets by using electrical field or just spray using electrical field and then you can dissolve it or dissolve. So, these are the different techniques of ionization which is done. So, you see SIMS comes one of the techniques of ionizations, not only SIMS there are many other techniques. So, that is why I want to discuss mass spectroscopy in togetherness. Now, how do you then after creating the ions you have to analyze the masses, how to analyze the masses? There are host of techniques available that is what the discoveries happen. First and very simple one is single focusing magnetic deflection which I will tell you. Second one is double focusing magnetic analyzer. Third one which is widely used is quadrupole mass analyzer. Then you have mass analyzer and the last one which is very popular one is known as time of flight mass analyzer. Let us look at them. This particular is slide is on single focus mass spectrometer. This is very simple technique, very simple technique. This is this picture schematic is taken from this one there is a presentation available on the website. What is done here? Let me first explain the theory. This is the most common type separator at any given accelerating voltage V suppose all the singly charged ions are provided some kinetic energy and that is given by is this electronic charge E multiplied by the accelerating voltage V must be equal to kinetic energy of the charge PC that is half mb square. Now, if you allow this charge accelerated species to pass through a magnetic field which is shown here, this is the magnet you see. The charge ions will experience a magnetic force and this magnetic force is given by H E V where H is the magnetic field strength. So, therefore, this is balanced, this magnetic force is balanced by the centrifugal force obviously. So, that means we can write down H E V must be equal to centrifugal force that is m b square by r. So, you get m by E is equal to h square r square by 2 V straight forward and this is what is the classical equation which allows us to separate different pieces with different values of m by E ratio. So, as you can see depending on the different m by E ratio if you keep h and v constant r will change. So, therefore, lighter ones will come at a, as a smaller r and heavier ones come as a very large r. So, that is how actually you can differentiate between different a, a pieces, charge pieces with different m by e ratios. It is very simple actually. In fact, the first you charge, then accelerate, and then accelerate is charged are passed through the magnetic field and it separates out. That is how it is done. So, we are focusing with a single magnets that is why it is called a single focus mass spectrometer. Remember this is actually how we can actually separate the ions very easily and subsequently what all techniques separate techniques you will see they are actually modification of this one. So, it is very high resolution it is instrument gives actually it gives you quite substantially high resolutions in the sense of PPM level detection possible. 
In this type of instrument two ion beams from independent sources passes side by side through a common mass analyzer and detected by separate collectors. This is used to compare sample with a standard or a through different ionic condition resolving power is order of 3000, 30000 sorry. Such resolving capability enables high molecular weight fragments which differ only by one mass unit. That means, if there are two pieces with a mass unit difference of 3000, 30000 and 29999 still we can detect by this that is what the resolution of this instrument. Next one which is uh, also widely used quite some time is known as double focus mass spectrometer. What is double focus mass spectrometer? Well, single focus mass spectrometer you have seen here we are using two focusing magnets. So, you have a you can see this is the lens and then basically ion sources come through this, this is the ion source and then it passes through a lens there is a source slit and then there is a magnetic field it just basically magnetic sector it just separate this ions out or filters the masses and then it passes through this single mass whichever is whichever is basically you know passing through this radius which is matching with the slit will pass through a to the detector. So, if you change the slit little bit or if you change the magnetic uh, magnetic moment as h value you can allow either this one or this one or this one to pass through the slit and be detected that is the advantage as compared to the first technique the single focus mass spectrometer. It has very much better resolution than the single focus mass spectrometer that is mainly because there is a extra measurement like this possible here. That is why it is called a double focus because first you are focusing with a magnetic sector then you are focusing with the electrostatic sector and that is how actually you can detect very precisely each and every atom uh, charge pieces. This is again taken from one of the websites which is available on the internet. Next one and uh, probably one of the best one is quadrupole mass analyzer. The reason I am saying this is the best one because it allows us even better measurement than single focus or, or double focus magnetic spectrometer. Well, it makes uses use of a combination of direct current and air frequency electric field applied to four parallel rods remember it is applied to four parallel rods to separate ions according to their mass by charge ratio. So, we are using direct current as well as rare frequency electric field and using four parallel rods this are all that is why it is called quadrupole to separate the ions. What is done here? This is taken from Vickerman's book. So, you have a sample you create ions by different ionizing techniques and then you have one two these are actually filters ok post or p filters quadruple they are the four important ones and then it passes through this you know region where this quadruple actually separates the ions depending its mass to charge ratio and detected. You can see here this is DC voltage, this is RF voltage you can apply and repeat these are the four probes of different dimensions. Now, if I plot the movement of the ions you can see here this is the two parameters A and Q, Q is the charge and A is basically the distance between the quadrupoles. So, if you can see the plots you see here there are different regions this is u by b constant low resolution u by b constant high resolution ok u by b u and b. This is u minus delta u by v constant by constant resolutions and this is what is the region of stability. So, that means, we can change u and v in such a way u is basically DC voltage and v, uh, v is the RF voltage uh, magnitude. So, by playing around these two we can actually get into this region of stability and that is the region one which you need to work. Obviously, if you want to work with u by b constant high resolution region you can do that or you can want to work with constant resolution you can do that depending on the systems on which you are working on. 
So, as you see here this gives us many many possibilities of changing the conditions and do the measurements. Third uh, fourth technique which is important is iron trap mass spectrometer. As the name suggests is basically traps as you know uh, Paul actually got Nobel prize because of iron trap mass uh, the technique availability I have told you that in 1983. Iron beam currents are normally of the order of 10 to minus 15 to minus 19 amperes, so very small. That is because the number of ions present in the source beam is very small. This technique generally employed ion collectors and they are actually photographic plates or electron multipliers. So, electron what is done here? You have basically filament and which actually creates ions, a charged species. And then we have this kind of ring electrodes which basically collects or traps this ions and after that we can actually use this mass spectroscopy or use this kind of you know single focus or more double focus or quadruple and then we can actually analyze uh, these ions by mass by charge ratio and finally we can detect them using transducer that is why we did. So, basically preparation wise is different distinct difference from the other three techniques. This is normally not used much except for few uh, specific applications this one is also taken from this website. Well the last technique which I am talking about is what is known as time of flight mass spectrometer. The schematic shows the technique actually what is here you look at it very carefully. You have an ion gun which creates or ionizes the ionizes, ionizes the pieces and then there is a pulsing action it can pulse actually ion gun can obviously pulse like a laser beam and then you can focus this it can also it also allows the ion gun also allows to raster like a CM the ions and then once it falls on the target it creates ions from the surface surface and then it passes through this extractor which extract the ions which are coming from this from because of this uh, ionization due to ion gun that means we are creating a secondary ions actually and then basically ion mirrors which is nothing but a quadrupole detector or maybe a time of flight detector it basically suppresses the ion and detector detects and gives you the spectrum. Correct so many cases as you create more ions so you have to have a electron flood gun otherwise charge balance will not be there in the sample surface. In a more sophisticated design the time of flight analyzers corrects for the small differences in initial energy and angle in order to achieve high mass resolutions. It is a combination of linear drift paths, electrostatic sectors or the ion mirrors which are used and results are actually comes with the mass resolutions of the above 10,000 can be achieved. Advantage of, of this technique about the quadrupole and the magnetic sector type is that extremely high transmission parallel detection of all masses and unlimited mass range is possible. Yes because it does not use because what we are doing is basically time of flight measurements how much time a mass takes to fly or move in a particular distance and depending on that we can differentiate among different pieces. We are not using the exactly m by z ratio. So, let us let me just give the mathematics of it pulses of secondary ions are accelerated as you know ion gun creates secondary ions and pulses of secondary ions are accelerated to give to, to a given potential which is of the order of certain kilo electron volt 3 to 8 such that all the ions possess the same kind of energies. Then these ions are allowed to dip through a field P space remember after this ions are accelerated passing the ions they are allowed to pass through a dipped through a field P space we are not applying any magnetic electric static field before reaching a detector. And when it passes to because they are the same kinetic energy m by m b square but velocities will be different. So, because of this masses are different velocities will be different because of this the time it takes to move a length will be given by L m by 2 z v half L is basically 
the length path length flight path length m is the mass z is the z is the atomic the ionic charge and v is the accelerating voltage so as you can see depending on m by z values if for even l and v are constant t will be differed and by knowing the different times we can actually separate these ions very easily this is actually widely used now what the whole worldwide technique and it has many advantages now if i go back to the previous slide that's what is done in the ion mirror between the extractor and ion bear what is done is that this secondary ions having a same kind of energy travels or dips to a path of certain lengths lengths may be this much and get separated out and then we can plot i will show you the plots also later we can plot uh, and get idea of that so uh, this is uh, i am going to discuss in detail when i come to sims so but to give you some idea in, in a static sim experiments it actually analyzes the original non modified surface compositions uses time of flight measurements and uh, it uh, basically is a quasi quasi non static surface analysis because it's uses very low ion dose well as uh, i have talked about a lot of different uh, magnetic uh, focus like single mirror magnetic focus or double magnetic focus or even quadrupole let me just give you some idea about what a radius of curvature means how does the ions actually get curved radius of curvature are of any ions of distinct m by z ratio traveling through a perpendicular magnetic field b after it has been accelerated by certain potential is nothing but 1 by b within bracket 2 mv by z to the power half so if b is constant v is constant it depends on the m by z so the travel ions actually traveling as i go back i can so yeah ions which are traveling a different radius that will depend on m by v so that's what actually used in this technique now after giving a huge introduction lot of things i have talked about it about the mass spectroscopy let me just get into details of the secondary ion mass spectroscopy although there are many things which are similar but distinct things the things which are distinct in sims as compared to this ms or mass spectroscopy i is to be known to you very clearly sims per se is a surface analysis technique remember this mass spectroscopy may not be surface analysis technique sims is basically a specifically surface analysis technique it is used to characterize surface and sub surface regions of any material that's actually what makes sims very popular even if you have a thin film on the surface of any material you can analyze it to the precision of sims it can give you ppm level precision it effectively employs the mass spectrometry what i discussed of ionized particles which are emitted when a solid surface is bombarded by energetic particles the schematic diagram on the right side or to you is showing this picture we have a incident ion source it can be ion which i am going to discuss any ion in fact this is what is our uh, one of the things which i'll discuss incident ions which can be either cesium ion or it can be oxygen ion or it can be uh, other ions but mostly cesium and oxygen ions are used which are actually accelerated with a certain uh, kinetic energies and then they are allowed to fall on the surface of a sample or a target and once it comes it creates a cascade of events in which emitted secondary ions from the samples are emitted so primary particles are mostly ions or either it can be protons also or it can be neutral pieces also it can be charged pieces also but they are actually uh, primary ions and uh, they embed are there actually the sample surface and creates the ions now is if i have to tell you about that you know in a secondary i have sims the primary ion sources are actually uh, uh, created by instrument called called duo plasmon plasmoton is known as duo plasmoton plasmoton it is the one which can create different ions and uh, it can actually uh, use it can create ions like you know different gases oxygen is basically commonly used in the in the sims 
oxygen can comes as a O minus or O2 plus or it can comes even O2 minus. We are surprised what are these? O minus is basically when oxygen all the oxygens are tripped, O2 plus is that means one oxygen is tripped, O2 minus is one extra added oxygen, uh, electron is added. So that is why, so that means we can have positive charge ion, negatively charged ion and also heavier charge ion O2 minus and O minus. So we can create all kinds of charge pieces and then these ion, primary ions are allowed to fall on the sample surface to create this. So uh, you know this uh, O2 O minus is O minus ion is the most abundant pieces used while positive ions are also used. If you have a insulating material then we have to use O minus ion because otherwise there will be charge built up on the surface. And the second type of SIMS also uses something known as cesium ion. It is uh, to enhance actually yield of this electro negative elements like carbon, oxygen or even sulphur because they are very low atomic uh, mass elements. We use CS GAN, cesium GANs actually operate in the positive modes to create the CS plus ions. Generally CS beams are smaller and uh, then generated by duo plus moton, duo plus moton creates oxygen ions basically and you can create others but mostly and uh, so but the CS GANs are basically much finer and it can sputter basically this is nothing but sputtering process. You are Come, uh, bringing in primary ions and sputtering, you can sputter actually more material effect material effectively because of their greater mass. And uh, it is normally used to uh, use to extensively uh, measure the different isotopes and uh, when you use insulating material you can always use CS plus beams. As you know uh, the uh, most of these things are surface ionization process. So therefore, it leads to heating up of the samples and sometimes it can create other problems also. So uh, let me just give little bit give idea about what is the collusion, what does the collusion happens. This is nothing but a collusion cascade, a sample is prepared in a vacuum and when you put a primary ions of this much energy 3 to 20 kilo volts, it causes a collusion cascade among the surface atoms and between 1 and 10 are actually ions are created. This is obviously sputtering but sputtering by using primary ions, sputter yield depends on nature of the analog sample also. Now what is collision cascade? If you have an incident primary beam coming at an angle theta with respect to the surface normal, this can create large you can see number of secondary ions. So one can create other, other can create another one and then goes on that is what is called cascade, collision cascade and this leads to cascade mixing in the sample. So initial depth will be transient one and then finally when the cascade is stabilized this kind of origin of the surface ions is called steady state steps. So therefore measurements from the steady state depths are actually much better than the transient one. So we have discussed about collision cascade in a in a interaction of primary ions with the with the sample surface. To give you a better idea of that, I am just showing you the schematic picture. This one is showing you the atoms and the primary and the secondary ions. As you see here, the different uh, primary uh, different atoms in the sample surface is shown here like this. Sorry. And these are known as target atoms, these are known as target atoms, these ones okay, which I marked. And uh, then you have a surface atoms which are marked in blue and you will always have a whole layer which contains contaminations. So primary ions which are coming at a very high energy, they come and hit suppose this is a primary ion comes and hit this atom and this atom is rejected or moved. This atom has many choices, it can either go and hit this or hit this or this one and subsequently those atoms which are hit can also hit the other atoms and that is how this cascade is created. And finally it hits the surface atoms and the secondary ions comes into picture and these are all secondary ions as shown there. 
So, of this ejected atoms, some are ionized, usually less than 10 percent, and these are all called secondary ions. The matrix of a sample must be known to accurately determine the elemental concentrations as ionization yields can vary very much as much as order of 3 orders of magnitude between nearly identical atomic sputtering yields. Secondary ions can then be analyzed using mass spectroscopy which I have discussed. Now, there are many primary ion source in SIMS. The most widely used as I discussed is oxygen and the cesium, but one can use also electron as an ion a source. You can have a high current density of electrons like to analyze basically argon or xenon. You can always use plasma. Plasma is nothing but uh, hyper, uh, you know, it's a ionic charge uh, gas. It is a high pressure gas, high electron density. And plasma is formed normally is formed in dual plasmaton, which I discussed. You can always have an air frequency for oxygen and argon. You can also have something known as surface ionization. Ion emission is thermally stimulated by warming an absorbed layer of cesium on a high working metal like iridium. You can do that because the thermal simulation can always lead to surface ionization. Easiest but the best one is the field emission, field ionization. You can strip off electrons from the source atoms very neatly by using a high local electric field. For that you need to have a very fine tip and this is what done in atom probe or you can have a liquid metal typically gallium on a tungsten tip. So, uh, this all can be any of these things can be used other than even uh, you know also you can use uh, cesium and oxygen as I said. Now, what is basically the sputtering process all this is a collision cascade, but it is basically a sputtering. The process of sputtering is described by the principle of classical mechanics by binary collisions of primary ions with a single target atoms. Depending on the energy range of the primary particles or primary ions, elastic and elastic, inelastic scattering both are possible. The dominant interactions in the kilo electron volt range are elastic collisions. They can be described by a parameter which is well known as a nuclear stopping power in the literature. And this is defined as the energy loss of the primary particles per path length. So, if, if an energy primary particles are ener losing energy because of the sputtering process, we can always take d by dx as a parameter to determine the interaction between the primary ions and the secondary, secondary ions. And this is what is known as nuclear stopping power. The number of inelastic collision increases with the rising energy as is usual. Inelastic scattering normally dominates if you have energies in the million electron volts. So, that is why very high energy ones actually leads to lot of elastic, inelastic scattering which are not good. In those cases corresponding value to describe interaction is known as electronic stopping power and this is known as d by dx e. Nuclear stopping power actually contributes to the collision cascade. These are the two effective ways of basically terming this sputtering process. Now, it is also important to know the primary ion sputter yield by how many primary ions are actually when the sputtering how many uh, secondary ions are created per unit primary ion. This is taken from Vickerman's book you know this is a plot of yield versus energy. As you see yields varies from you know, minus 3 to 10 to by minus plus 2 that means it varies from very low value to 1000 and these are the different data from helium, xenon, argon or uh, some theoretical calculation or, or argon theoretical calculation you see here. Sputtering will actually varies from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the power 1 that is 10. It does not increases much. Yield means basically number of secondary ion created per primary ions. So, that means when it is 10, one primary ion creates 10 secondary ions. When it is 10 to the minus 2, that means to create one secondary ion, you need 100 primary ions. So, as you see, as the energy increases, sputtering yield increases. So, if you normally we can use from 10 to 100, 150, 200 electron volts as the energy. Sometimes people use 3 to 10 also, this is also not bad you can see in this window also you have something like 5 to 6 secondary ions per unit 
power primary ions can be created. Well, obviously, as I said, O2 plus, O minus, O2 minus ions are used. If you use that, we can actually uh, create secondary ions if we use this as a primary ion. So, positive secondary ion yields when you have O2 plus bombardment is plotted here as a function of atomic number. If you see for elements like nitrogen, sulfur, tellurium, gold, platinum, very low log to the power actually 3. But if you go to this one magnesium, calcium, palladium, manganese, iron, these sets, it is very high. I plus is of the order to the power 4, 5. So, therefore, uh, the, uh, the amount of yield or amount of the uh, secondary ions created when you have O2 plus bombardment is good for this kind of elements, not for other ones. If you use CS plus bombardment, what happens? This is M minus plus M plus ions plus atomic number. As you see here, uh, this is taken from this paper in analytical chemistry uh, from American Chemical Society. As you see here, zero yield, zero uh, log zero is basically means one. So, is above this, these are good. So, that for called carbon, oxygen, sulfur, silicon, phosphorus, arsenic, selenium, germanium, to some extent silver, antimony, tellurium, iridium, platinum and gold, cesium is good. But for these metals like iron, aluminum, magnesium, zirconium, tungsten, probably oxygen 2 plus ion is better. That is what is shown here. So, that is why CS and the O2 plus they can complement each other as a primary beam to create good yield of the secondary ions. And this is what is I am showing in a periodic table, secondary ion yields when a uh, primary beams like that. The factor that in the secondary ion is in efficiency seems are oxygen bombardment increases with the yield of positive ions, cesium bombardment yield of negative ions as you see. The increases, the increases can range up to 4 order magnitudes. The yellow ones basically are O2 positive secondary ions and green ones are basically CS positive leads to ions lead to negative secondation. If you see here this one, this lithium, sodium and also this set of atoms or this set of actually uh, elements are good for oxygen uh, plus positive ions to create secondary ion yields on the other and there are also good. On the other hand, there are set of atoms like this even carbon, nitrogen all this group here, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, silicon, phosphorus all they are actually good for. I mean, will be large amount of secondary yields will possible when you use CS plus primary ions. Well, uh, so that means if I consider positive and negative ion yield processes, then I need to tell you that oxygen enhancement process occurs as a result of metal oxygen bonds in an oxygen rich zone. So, therefore, those are metals which are which will form very good metal oxygen bonds, they will only they will form better secondary ion yields. When these bonds break in an ion emission process, oxygen becomes negatively charged because of its high electron affinity, which favors electron capture and its high ionization potential inhibits the positive charging. So, metal is left with a positive charge then. So, oxygen beam sputtering increases the concentration of the oxygen in the surface layer. That is possible because oxygen actually first bonds with metal and forms this bond, then its bond breaks oxygen ion remains there, metal ion gets comes out. Enhancement, enhanced negative ion yield is normally produced by the cesium bombardment and this is can be explained by work function that are reduced, that are reduced by implant, implantation of cesium into the sample surface. More secondary electrons are excited of the sample potential barrier and this leads to increase availability of electrons leading to increase negative ion formation. So, as you clearly understood now that oxygen bombardment will lead to positive ion creation, cesium bombardment lead to negative ion creation. So, therefore, the metals in which positive ion creations are easier, all, all metals actually positive ion creation is easier, but oxygen absorption is easier, it is better to use oxygen enhancement and other things metalloids or even you know some other metals specific metal like copper other things here I have shown you, zinc. Uh, sorry, copper, silver, gold, uh, and the heavy metals like bismuth, metal oil like bismuth, antimony, tin, 
tellurium you can use cesium. Obviously, secondary ion yields depends on elements type of elements which you are dealing with. Secondary ion ions efficiency is very is a very well defined things it is nothing but a fraction of the sputter ions that become ionized. You have large number of sputter atoms only 10 or 15 percent atoms becomes ionized. So, that fraction is known as secondary ion yield. As you know ion yield vary over orders of magnitudes for different various elements that means there is an elemental effect. The most obvious influence is on the ion yields are basically ionization potential of the positive ions. Otherwise, if the ion potential is very high, it will create it will sputter an atom, not an ion, and also electron affinity of the negatively charged ions. For example, this figure actually shows a logarithmic positive ion yield as a function of ionization potential. Ion yields are relative to the silicon in a silicon matrix with oxygen sputtering. So, what you see here cesium, ruthenium, and the rubinium and sorry, potassium has a very high ionization yield whereas neodymium, neon, neon and helium has a very low ion yield. In fact, fluorine is also in a borderline case. So, ionization potential is high means less secondary ion yield, high ionization potential low more secondary ion yields. That is obvious because then only we can create more ions by removing the electrons. So, that is actually how the secondary ion yields depends on. Not only that secondary ion has will have can kind have of different energies because we can create secondary ions, but whether they will be able to be traveling to a detector or not whether we will be able to collect them or not depends on their energy distributions. Sputtering process produces secondary ions with a range of kinetic energies. Energy distributions are distinctly different for atomic and molecular ions. Molecular ions have always relatively narrow transitional energy distribution because the kinetic energies in the internal vibration and rotational modes whereas atoms atomic ions have kinetic energy in transitional modes. So, following this figure actually showing us mono, di and triatomic ions as you see relative intensities of the mono atomic ions are much larger than bi and triatomic ions di and diatomic atoms that is understandable because as the uh, number of ions are increases number of actually charge increases it is you know they will have less probability to presence. So, as you see this is a plot of relative intensity versus energy. So, only in a particular energy window between between about 2 to 8 uh, volts you have a relatively high intensity of all the different types of ions. So, I have given you a uh, lot of idea about primary ions sputtering yield of secondary ions and also the factors which control the secondary ion yield. Let me just give you some idea about how a sim spectrum look like. Sim spectrum can be plotted in two ways first one is shown at the top which is nothing but a plot between intensity versus mass to charge ratio. One can actually scan in B and V that is magnetic field or voltage static electric field applied to or the to sweep masses across single detector. As you see here this is fluid ion this is fluid 2 ion this is CF 3 ion this is C 2 F 3 ion we can distinctly difference between this negatively charged ions depending on this mass to charge ratio. Not only that we can even quantitatively calculate from this intensities how much of 19 mass by charge mass actually fluid ions are you present or the double ions are present C F 3 or C 3 F 3 minus ions are present or not. This is one way of plotting the data other way of plotting the data is to plot the different masses into multiple cups without changing the B and V. In this case we are changing B and V in the top picture. So, that we can sweep all the masses here we are not changing B and V we are basically have different masses as a cups this is relative ion current versus magnetic field strength that is B. As you see here at any constant B value you have different relative ions for 88, 87, 86 atomic number species. So, you get a cup like picture whenever you plot for the whole magnetic fields for the or by values of a large range of magnetic fields. So, you can basically get a cup and this cups gives you different uh, charge pieces. If you plot basically sims can measure starting from lithium to uranium. So, if you want to show the relative intensities of the peaks for different metals this is the best one. 
here you have I am showing you intensity versus mass to charge ratio what you see here is basically starting from lithium to uranium the m by z values and intensities. So, uh, as you see here certain uh, the m by z if the m by z is you know low lower than actually certain areas like this one you have a very high intensity of your 10 to the power 6 10 to the power 5 counts per second. Whereas, here if it is m by z is very high lead, thorium, uranium uh, even uh, higher numbers. So, you can see here the the yield is sorry the intensity is low. You can actually see even that uh, intensity is low for even barium, barium compounds also. So, uh, that means the intensity of the of the of these secondary ions which is detector by detector depends also on the mass by charge ratio. So, the secondary ion mass spectroscopy what all things are there obviously I have discussed about the ion source primary ions you need a sample primary ions comes and hit the sample create secondary ions then you have a energy analyzer or other energy grabber which or the secondary ion grabber which grabs and analyze the energy and these ions are then passed to the mass spectrometer and then it which separates the ions depending on m by z values and you detect. So, you can actually have a mass spectrum which I have shown you. You can also have a depth profile which I am going to discuss which is very important material science and you can actually also create an image of two dimensional image. Actually truly speaking you can create a three dimensional image also in a sense it is so powerful technique. So, this is the one I have shown you that is why I wanted to show you this before I show the basic overview. Now, I am going to show you how depth profile quantification and image formation is done. Well, as you said may, this one these are different mass uh, analyzer use and the idea is to show you how uh, their relative behavior is. If you have a quadruple mass spectrometer you have a resolution of 10 to the power 2, 10 to the power 3 that means 100 to 1000 mass ranges which can be detected is less than 1000 transmission is pretty low all the cases, but it is lower in lowest in the quadruple mass detection is sequential one by one sensitivity in a scale of 10,000 uh, 10, is one. If you use a magnetic sector that curve magnetic sector I shown you it is a resolution 10 to the power 4 at 10,000 mass ranges can be very high that means you can detect 10 to the power 4 and higher transmission is also quite high quite high means higher than the quadruple. 0.1 to 0.5 again measurement is sequential sensitivity is better than quadruple but not very high best one is that is what I said you in the lecture is time of flight time of flight has a high resolution 10 to the power 3 or higher it can scan mass ranges from 10 to the power 3 10 to the power 4 it has a very good transmission approximately close to 1 it can detect masses parallelly sequence not sequence parallelly together that is advantage and it has a very high relative sensitivity 10 to the power 4 10,000. So, that means time of flight is very strong. So, therefore, you can clearly see that time of flight is the best option for us or for the sims and that is why it is widely used in the different machines. Now, SIMS analysis can be done in different ways. One, the most widely used one is static SIMS, which are used to determine the surface concentration of elements and molecules without significantly altering the sample. Then you can image SIMS, that is what I said a few minutes back. Like static SIMS does not alter the sample appreciably. This mode used to generate images or maps based upon the concentration of secondary ions representing either an element or molecule. You can have also a dynamic SIMS involving the use of a much higher energy beams primary beams, but it is used to generate normally depth profiles not uh, these the two dimensional profiles. So, along the depth you can measure the concentrations. In a static SIMS actually sorry static SIMS actually you can use static seems you can actually use low ion flux. This means a small amount of primary ions are used or is used to bombard the sample bar unit time sputters it sputters have the approximately only tenth of atomic monolayer very small flux. 
So, we use normally argon, xenon ions or argon and xenon and uh, it has a diameter of very small like 2 3 nanometers. Analysis typically analysis typically requires more than 15 minutes. It generates a mass spectra data well suited for detection of the organic molecules. To give you some results it is taken from polyethylene methylate sims both positive and negative sims data. See that you can detect actually different I do not know whether you can see C3H5 plus C3H5, C15H5 or this kind of DCO, C3H5 things positive ions, positive ions and negative ions if you use like cesium or things which can create as a so you can actually have these are different negative ions CH3O minus C3OH minus C2CH minus or uh, this ones. So, depending on the uh, you know different positive and negative ions you can actually detect all of them using this static steps. Fragmentation and subsequent ion formation of the sample can reveal the overall structural molecule through this mass spectroscopy is possible to do. Next one which I have already discussed is time of flight. Time of flight is the most notable one. Here actually you have an ion gun which can pulse in, pulsed and actually raster also and falls on the, the primary ions falls on the sample surface then secondary ions are generated. You can extract the secondary ions by using extractor and then it passes to a long distance and during the uh, they actually extract and accelerate with the same voltage same kinetic energies different volts and kinetic energies means kinetic energy of each ions are same at the beginning and when they travel the long distance the time of flight varies by this way we can detect. This is a sophisticated instrument as I said and used for uh, many many applications and uh, so uh, this is the equation I showed you so depending on the m by z values you can have a different time scale and you can detect that. Sims and time of flight operations actually very popular one it uses uh, it is a extractive technique you can remove the sample and measures the, their intense the secondary ions and then uh, one by one layer wise removal possible and measure the compositions uh, one by one. So, that is why it is used so you have a uh, sputter uh, you know time of uh, sputter ions and then time of flight and then online mass spectrometer. Well, uh, we should also know some aspect about the intensity or species of the secondary ions and this is basically equal to I p y alpha a q c a t. As you see it basically depends on primary current density total sputter yield of the primary current. Alpha is nothing but ionization probability of the charge state q, c a is the fractional concentration of the element A in the matrix and T is the instrumental transmission function. So, transmission function is, uh, is that is why I have shown you in, in the few slides before. So, as you see here uh, this is strong function of I p and y that is why you discussed about the primary current primary ions and this sputtering yield they actually determine uh, along with alpha and other factors exactly secondary ion concentration species. Well, there are problems in, in using in this data because this is what is the total intensity and this can be used to quantify and there are problems. The problem is that y total depends moderately on C A not only that alpha also depends strongly on C A. So, it is basically that means I I of the, uh, the intensity of secondary ion is not linearly proportional to C A uh, there will be matrix effects that is why sometimes it is not possible to measure exactly the uh, quant the, the quantify this thing there will be always some error involved. Well, uh, sims can also be used to raster or getting and time of flight it is done and if you have a different path this is the beam path you can see here beam path follows like this. So, this is nothing but electronically gated area you can actually create a cater and as you raster every point you can measure the sims profile by time of flight and once you do that every point you measure you can actually get the composition values and by this way you can create a three dimensional map. Another important thing which seems allows you to do is the depth profile. What is it? Well, one can actually do slowly remove the material from the sample surface in the depth direction and measure the concentrations. Well, the important aspect in such a case is the depth resolution. 
what we are showing here is the intensity or concentrations of the certain pieces as a function of you know the uh, you know sputtering time or the depth as you see here this is the 100 time intensity which is good till certain time then it falls off near the surface. So that means this is good in this region not good in this region ok. So that is what actually can be done in a in a sims depth resolution profile. One can actually use sims for uh, kind of imaging or surface imaging because you can raster. So if you can raster you can actually image by rastering a finely focused ion beams over a surface like this and uh, one can actually create mass dissolved secondary ion images. It is basically nothing but a scanning electron microscopic image but here we are getting mass dissolved secondary images and as you see here if I have a beam primary beam which I can raster on the sample surface and then each point from each point we can generate secondary ions and measuring the secondary ion types and the yield of that and quantifying the, the different elements we can actually create a map. It is just like a elemental map in a SCM you have different peaks from different element comes and then uh, from a particular point and then measuring the peak intensity you can measure the quantify the particular element and you can map that is exactly done it here same thing you can use instead of a electron uh, microscopy using uh, this in a in a uh, secondary ion mass spectroscopy and uh, this is what a picture you get colorful picture you see here it shows you concentration of the three different pieces one is green blue and little bit red. So that means it is possible go that. Not only that as I said it is possible to do depth profiling in constant static seems experiment the dynamic ones actually high primary dose densities uh, can be applied in this and it can give you successive removal of the respective top surface layers and by occurring spectra during the sputtering the in depth distribution of elements and small clusters can be monitored. So as you see here this is a volume which is parted slowly and raster also obviously. So you just start from this part and then go then you come back then come back blow like the raster. So one surface layer is removed and you measure the composition then you go in a depth direction and then do the same thing rastering and get the distribution of elements in a three dimensional or otherwise you can actually keep the beam constant static do not uh, do the boom beam and just sputter along a certain directions and measure the constants from the elements. Obviously uh, I have given a lot of examples different examples all sorts of examples I have given as you see here one must know very clearly that there are a very advanced measurements can be done using SIMS. This is a technique which is used extensively in material science and surface science to analyze the composition of solid surfaces and also thin films by sputtering the surface of the specimen with a focused primary ion beam and collecting and analyzing the ejected secondary ions. Secondary ions are then measured using a mass spectrometer. You can do elemental, isotropic, molecular composition of the surfaces. Actually, you can do, I could measure elements from you know hydrogen to uranium not hydrogen actually you can do lithium to uranium very easily you can actually detect element down to concentration from 1 ppm to 1 ppb isotope ratios can be measured isotope ratios means if you oxygen has 3 or 4 isotopes what are the abundance of the isotopes can be determined normally to precision of 0.5 to 0.05 percentage which cannot be done by using any other techniques you can actually do two dimensional ionic image measurements the ionic images which I shown you a secondary ion leaves the surface at a point close to the original location this enables localized analysis of a sample to be undertaken and is a correction it is a constant cornerstone of the images. So not only that you can actually have three dimensional uh, ion images can be acquired by scanning or rastering the primary beam and detecting that it requires very little sample pressure let me tell you very little sample pressure unlike in SEM on the TM you do not require much sample operations and uh, you can actually do uh, many other things you can actually 
uh, material sputter actually as you can you might be thinking material sputter is very large here yeah, no sputtering is few uh, no few fractions of distance of atomic layer on the surface. So, sputtering is small you do not damage very but only when you do dynamic seems you damage the sample surface and but there are problems and as and so I have just given you the dimensional image volume of the material sputter is small I told but it has some limitations it is not a foolproof technique. The major limitation of this technique is that the material which is part of a sample surface it not only consists of monoatomic ions but also consists of molecular pieces that in places can actually dominate the smart spectrum, spectrum and making the analysis of this element impossible. This is very uh, obvious because you have a high energy primary source and this high energy primary source can bombard and create you know <coughs> molecular pieces like CH4 plus CH3 plus CH3 uh, minus pieces can be created in organic things many others normally in metals it is not possible, but it can create metal complexes because cascade of uh, this primary ion events can lead to mixing and mixing can lead to even formation of metal complexes. Second important thing which is bad about this is this whole sputtering process which is the main thing in a sims is very poorly understood. We do not have any quantitative model so far that can accurately predict the secondary ionization process there is no. So, that is actually makes us uh, assume certain things for the secondary ion generation process and because and that assumption actually makes the technique a little bit uh, less uh, attractive in the sense that uh, we do not know really how the secondary ions are actually created what are the process. So, we have no idea we can measure the yields and other things, but we have no idea uh, theoretically also we cannot model it. Third thing is that you know to obtain a quantity information of a suitable standard you have to have a quantity information in a suitable standard that is the case for everything you know in a CM also EDS also requires uh, uh, so measurements of these requires a standard. Third thing is that sensitivity of an element is strongly dependent on the composition of the matrix remember you are putting the element in a matrix organic matrix liquid matrix. So, it depends on the matrix we have shown that the even the intensity is also function of the matrix is not a linear with only the element present and also type of primary beams you do used six standards should therefore, be close to the composition of the unknown. This is particularly true for isotopic analysis. Lastly samples which we are doing must be compatible at high vacuum it should not degrade inside the vacuum system because you are using a very high vacuum system you know minus 6 minus so you know minus 9 to minus 10 tor under that vacuum it should not transform or should not degrade uh, to other thing else that is basically a big limitation for that otherwise it has many advantages and uh, so with this I actually close uh, this discussion on the sims and uh, only thing I need to do is to compare these three techniques subscription technique like XPS, Augier and the sims and tell you how uh, these techniques can be used in different things.